Fifteen. Very nice to be here. So there's a question we ask each other all the time um, that is arguably both dumb and dangerous. That question is, it sounds very innocent. What do you want? What do you want? Seems harmless enough, but it's an ambiguous question. The problem is that word, you. We're not simple beings, it turns out. Uh, Walt Whitman said in a phrase that has sparked a million internet memes, I contain multitudes. Rumi said, you're not a drop in the ocean. You are an ocean in a drop. We're a whirring, whirling mix of thoughts, emotions, instincts, and identities. And we're a social species. We are massively influenced by each other, the context of when and how we're asked that question. So for example, if I asked you right now whether after the excellent dinner you perhaps recently consumed, you still truly desired to insert further additional calorific substances into your body, you would tell me, I guess, well, no, of course not. And yet, if I were to wave a plate in front of you, fresh from the oven with cookies, with a sort of soft swirl of chocolate right in their centers, you might be amazed to see your hand reaching out, grab one and pop it into your mouth. So, ma'am, what do you want? The simplest mental model to help us make sense of this, I think was offered by the great psychologist, Danny Kahneman, uh, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He described how um, so much of human behavior can be described by looking at two different systems. You call them system one and system two. System one is our fast thinking selves, our instinctive selves that drive actually so much of what we do, quick decisions, quick decisions, so much of what we feel, the emotions we have, how we react to people in an instant, um, it's all system one thinking. And then system two thinking is our reflective selves, slower, and often, you know, it comes from the sort of frontal cortex, it's a more recent evolutionary development, we think, in our, in our brain, so it's literally different neurological systems are in play here. But it's our storytelling selves, it's ourselves that kind of rate what we've done and, and perhaps at the end of the day, help us decide whether we feel good about the day or not. So which of these selves should we optimize for? I mean, our instinctive selves are not all bad by any means, it's often um, they're often responsible for the most wonderful things that happen to us. It's often absolutely the right thing to do to let our hair down and just immerse and go with the flow. Um, but I think ultimately it's our reflective selves which serve, which give us a greater sort of sense of meaning, purpose, fulfillment in our lives on our deathbeds when we ask ourselves if we've left lives that we're proud of, um, that's our reflective selves talking. Um, and so I think you could argue that the single most important question we can actually ask ourselves is how do we empower those reflective selves over our instinctive selves, or as I sometimes call them, our lizard brains. I think this, process could serve as the foundational question of any educational system, actually, for it carries with it all the skills needed to manage our time, our money, our relationships, and our habits. It's foundational to the building of character. Now, in many areas of life, we figured out how to fight this battle. We make careful dietary plans and sometimes even stick to them. We take huge efforts to try against all odds to make vegetables taste nice so that we can trick that lizard into desiring them. We hire personal trainers to guilt us into working out when we otherwise wouldn't. We read self-help books and maybe even watch TED Talks for goodness sake in a desperate attempt to reduce our proclivity for procrastination. 
we construct elaborate social mores to help us avoid turning a moment of sexual temptation into a lifetime of regret. But there is one area where I think we've so far failed to engage properly in this battle between our reflective selves and our lizard brains. The news, the news. You know, I was brought up in South Asia and uh, the news always felt like this extraordinary, objective, external thing delivered from afar, BBC World Service. Good evening. This is the news, read by Anthony Smythe. I mean, of course, it was objectively selected through some godlike process to give us surely the most significant developments of the day that any responsible citizen should know about. We think of the news as a completely healthy thing to engage in if we're going to participate in a democracy properly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I had a chance, I'm a, I'm a journalist, that's my first job out of college anyway, before I became a media entrepreneur. And I had a chance once to work on creating a, a world news bulletin. And that meant editing feeds that came in from the Associated Press and Reuters and so forth. And I found myself asking, what is it that makes someone like Associated Press put a label on certain stories that they think are the big stories. So AP puts something called bulletin on what it considers the very biggest stories of the day. And I start to say, what do these things have in common? And to cut a long story short, I crack the code and the code is something like this. If 100 people die violently anywhere in the world, that is your big story. That's your big story of the day. And the philosopher in me started to wonder about this. Why did they just choose that to be the big story of the day? I mean, there were definitely tweaks to it. If children were involved, it could be fewer than 100, could die, still be important. If it was a natural disaster far enough away, it would have to be a lot more than 100 who would have to die, frankly, for the rest of the world to care. But basically, the formula was about that. And I... I so why? How do they decide that that is the most important thing of the day? I mean, for one thing, how many people do you think die from other things every day? Do you know the answer to that? Well, I can tell you the answer is 159,900. Because about 160,000 people die every single day. We don't hear about them. There's actually pretty much as much sorrow in those families as there was in the hundred that died violently. Why do those things take priority? Well, I think we know why. Um, we have our lizard brain has this proclivity to pay attention to, dram to dramatic things, to dangers. Anything where something horrifying like that happens, we really care about it. And so we're drawn to it. But it doesn't make any logical sense. So here's another piece of news that you may not have heard that happened yesterday. Did you know that yesterday there was a soccer stadium full of 20,000 kids and terrorists burst in and they were about to kill every single one of those children. And they were heroically rescued by a team helicoptered in. They were medical professionals and they pulled out all those children and saved their lives. Incredible story. You didn't hear about it, right? Well, I had some of the details exaggerated there. It wasn't actually terrorism. It was diarrhea and other preventable childhood diseases. But the numbers are right. 20,000 children's lives were saved yesterday, yesterday and the day before and the day before that, compared with what happened just 30 years ago. We've gone from about 12 or 13 million child deaths per year to below five, thanks to the efforts of heroic people. Every day, 20,000 children's lives are saved. We don't know about this. We pay zero attention to it. So does this matter? Well, during the era of mainstream media, it didn't matter that much because 
quality news sources made up for the fact that they were slightly distorting our sense of what was actually happening with the world with lots of other solid news, solid reports of what's going on. But in the connected age that we're in right now, it doesn't work like that. We have entrusted the new selection process to algorithms. And algorithms learned it from us by asking us a very simple, beautiful question. What do you want? Well, what do you want when it comes to news? Let's say you're looking at two headlines. One of the headlines is, interesting innovation may one day impact the lives of many people. And the other is, someone you really don't like just said something really annoying. Which headline do you want? Well, of course you want the first, you do. And how horrified are you when you see your right hand reach out and click on the second? Because that's what you do, because that's our lizard brain calling. We pay attention to threats, things that might annoy us, things that might possibly in some environment be dangerous to us. That's what we pay attention to. And the problem with that is twofold. One is, that we are training the algorithm. The algorithm just discovered what humans actually want. And so they will amplify stories like that to other humans. And secondly, we are shaped by the stories we tell each other. We are, we're storytelling creatures. This is how we think of each other, how we come to believe the world. And so it is no surprise that we have created a machine which is generating outrage and dismay and division and anger in every direction. And we have come to believe that the future is dark and dangerous and hopeless and scary. And it is getting to the point where it is existentially alarming because we cannot solve problems without trusting each other and cooperating with each other and believing in each other at least a bit. So I'm really worried about where all this has gone. This internet thing that we thought was gonna bring the world together is actually driving us apart. And I can't stand that. I think there is an antidote, just about. There are ways in which we can get the good things to spread online as well. I wrote a book about this, it's called Infectious Generosity, and it is about the ways in which we can, with the right effort, trick our lizard brains a little bit into spreading the good stuff. We can figure out collectively through some of the efforts that we've made in other areas of our lives, how to engage our reflective selves and how to reveal the world that is out there of amazing humans doing absolutely wonderful, wonderful things and sharing knowledge and kindness and beauty and all manner of other things. But it's gonna take a giant collective effort if we don't engage in that effort, the algorithms will continue to gain in power. They'll be amplified further by artificial intelligence and we will succeed in turning each other into lizards. Let's not do that. Thank you.